Welcome to Good Tech, an ongoing discussion about ethics and technology. I'm Elizabeth Perry with IDCA. On our last show, we took a dive into marketing, attacking the big question, is our obsession with data hurting our marketing efforts and ultimately our bottom line? It was a really good discussion, an important one that made many of you think and even more of you want to hear more. Um, if you didn't catch it, you can listen here on ubngo.com or view it on the IDCA YouTube channel. Uh, today, following up on that conversation, we thought we'd take an even deeper dive into marketing, ethical marketing, that is. On the last episode, we talked about what we're doing wrong. It turns out treating our customers like data points instead of like human beings isn't really working in the long run. So what's the best way forward? We'll tackle that big question and more today. And a reminder to you, if you have any questions or comments during the show, we invite you to dial the number you'll see on your screen and we'll do our best to get you involved. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to welcome back to the show today our guest, author, veteran marketing expert, humanist, consumer historian, and all around nice guy. Welcome, Jason Voyevich. Hello, Elizabeth, I appreciate that. I appreciate the invite back. Uh, after the last conversation, kind of uh, blew everybody's mind a little bit and kind of went into a really different perspective. I'm glad to be invited back. Always glad to be uh, invited back. Glad to right. be as, Well, as marketing people, you know, we always like to be uh, in the spotlight, right? So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, thanks for joining us today again. And um, just to give viewers a bit of a background on the subject, uh, last show we talked about the good old days of marketing and starring your father, who's who was one, one of the, the mad men, men of, of his time. time. How, how we, now, how, how have we evolved, evolved as an industry since his days? days and, and what are some of the lessons you learned from him? That's funny, you know, it's one of the biggest things he used to, uh, you know, that when I think about him and when I remember him and I remember you know, the lessons he taught me when I was a kid, you know, kind of watching him work on advertising for clients, uh, you know, in our home office. And uh, when I was off school, he dragged me to the ad agency with him and I have to sit there and, you know, kind of see clients come in and see the advertising process happen. You know, what I've been so surprised about is really in some ways how much things have changed with so much more data, with, you know, some, so much more precision, but in other ways, how little things have changed uh, in that time, you know, that, as we've as we've gotten more data, data has become a little bit of a crutch, you know. And what I mean by that is, back in his day, you know, yeah, you'd have survey data, you might have census data, but that data might be ten years old. You know, it was expensive to go out and get consumer data, to get behavioral data, to get opinions. All that stuff was really hard. It was really expensive, so you had to do a lot of logical deduction. You had to do a lot of work. You had to do a lot of ethnography. You had to actually bring people. One of the biggest things I remember as a kid is going to the ad agency and being with my dad and having like they were doing laundry detergent and they'd have they'd have the washing machines set up in the agency and they'd wash clothes with people. They'd actually bring people in to actually do it so that they could see how people interacted with the washing machine and they'd actually see how it was done. And what he always used to tell me, and there are some great people around there who are always really nice to little kids, you know, uh, you know, they, they kept the, you know, profanity to a, to a, a dull roar uh, in the agency uh, when I was there at least. But what, what I remember the most is he said, the reason that we do that is like, we have all this data, you have all this Nielsen data and all this stuff is that the people aren't their Nielsen report. People aren't their survey results. People are complex, whole individuals. And if you don't 
see them that way and you don't really see, you know, anytime you use data, data is reducing people. You have to eliminate information. So think about it for a second. Like, you know, let's kind of fast forward that to today. Let's say you took a, you know, is your whole self your Google search history? That's kind of silly, you know, when you think about it that way that, like, yeah, I do a lot of searches on an average day. Is that me? It is, okay, I'm on Facebook, let's say, and I'm really not, but I'm on LinkedIn all the time professionally. Is that my whole professional life? The answer is obviously not, but it's almost like this religion that we have that, like, oh, we just, we have, we can track so much more data now that somehow we know the whole person based on their search history or based on their social media interactions. And it's just silly when you just put the littlest bit of scrutiny to that. It's just silly on its face. And it's something my dad understood in 1970 that a lot of marketing folks don't understand in 2019, that you might have a lot more data and it might be a lot easier to get, but it's not even close to telling you the story of the full person. And I, I think it's almost like a cult. It's almost like a religion that, like, oh, you don't trust this kind of human, you trust what you can measure. Mm -hmm. And not everything that's important can be measured. And that's the biggest thing I learned from him. And it's, it's still valid 50 years later. Right. Yeah. Um, we always have this image of uh, those days, you know, the show Mad Men and the, the animation and the thin ties and the, just the way they, uh, they got, anyway, that's another, that's another story altogether. But uh, so let's get into it. Um, we talk about personalization that happens today. And your view is that we should be worried about humanization and people really don't know the difference, it seems. So let's, let's get into it. What is the difference? Yeah, I think that's the, I, I think that's a, a really critical error. And I, we actually put together a little chart to kind of help compare and contrast the difference because they seem like to the average person, it seems like, well, those are, those are the same thing. Like personalizing and humanizing seems like the same thing. But really when you think about personalization, personalization is a technology and a data driven endeavor. What you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce people and you're trying to reduce that complexity down to something you can measure so that I can target a very specific idea, product or service to a very specific person. And ideally, I'd like to know Elizabeth is X, Y, and Z, or you know that you like blue shirts and you have blonde hair and you drink water. And if I knew those three data points, I would sell you some new, you know, you know, waterproof blue shirt that I could get, you know. So the whole idea behind personalization is that kind of reductive silliness, which is how do I get, how do I sell more of whatever junk I have to, you know, to an individual person? And how do I kind of match your exact preference to my exact product? And it, it, that example is not that far off. When you think about, you can't look at Elizabeth as the whole person and kind of who you are, where you are, what your history is. That's just too much. It's like, how do I just kind of zero in on these tiny little details to try to sell you? The problem is, it's like, well, yeah, I wore the blue shirt today to kind of better contrast on the video. I don't even really kind of maybe like blue shirts. And, you know, maybe like, yeah, I'm having water to keep my throat wet during this podcast. But if all I looked at was that data and these little data points, I could get completely the wrong impression about what this is. And when people see that happening, you know, think about that for yourself for just a second. When you see that start to happening, happen to you, it, it, doesn't it feel a little, not only does it feel a little creepy, it just yeah. feels wrong. It feels like, well, you're, you're not respecting me. You're just, I, I can tell you're trying to sell me something. And your defenses go up and really quickly you determine like, okay, defenses, defense shields activated. I'm going to, like, I, I, like, anything they say is based on really weirdo, creepy information. And maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I need to, like, hmm, maybe next time I'm going to turn the webcam off. Maybe next time I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to search for that, or I'm going to turn my browser to private mode, or I'm going to clear, clear all the cookies out, or I'm going to block all that stuff so that they can't see it. You know, the more you do stuff like that as a marketing person, the more, and the more people catch on because you're obviously wrong, the more people will start to subvert that over time. So it just doesn't work really over time. Humanization is really the opposite of that. Humanization is kind of looking at and respecting and thinking about the person as a whole. You know, what are they trying to accomplish in their life? What are, who are they? What are they all about? How do, how do I align really personalization aligns tactical, tangible things. Humanization mm -hmm. aligns to values. It aligns to what people want and hope and desire and their values. And that is something that I think the mad men did a lot better job at than the data men, if you want to call it that, and the data women. Uh, honestly, they don't understand how to connect people with values. And that's what people more and more want out of their products, especially as kind of organized formal religion has become less and less a part of life generally. People are looking mm -hmm. for meaning in what they buy. And it, marketers would be very smart to think about values-based humanization and spend a little bit less time on kind of oddly reductive personalization. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess you, you call it dehumanization as well um, in our conversations. Can you give me some examples of where or effects of dehumanization, just some real like maybe maybe there are people that have lost customers because they're dehumanizing their customers. Can you give me some concrete examples? Well, think about, uh, you know, I think the, the platforms today are kind of the biggest examples. We don't, you know, we don't need to, uh, you know, we, there, there are a few good ones. Uh, think about, uh, you know, there's a story in the, um, uh, uh, the story kind of making the rounds right now about how, you know, uh, you know how facial data from a, where I live in Minnesota in the United States, uh, facial recognition data and technology is being used based on the driver database in order to find, you know, in order to find people, whether they're finding criminals or whether they're finding whomever. But if you think about all that facial recognition data and what it's being used for, uh, you know, to do things that are kind of reducing people to a set of data points on a face in order to find them and either punish them or sell them or, you know, you know, whatever the case may be. We'll get into some specific, you know, more specific examples, you know, kind of throughout the balance of the podcast. But when I think about, well, who lost customers and who, you know, who did this? I think we kind of have a short memory as a kind of a marketing and, you know, uh, as a marketing group, it wasn't 20 years ago that, you know, Microsoft got into a lot of trouble over dehumanization and essentially mm -hmm. defaulting to Internet Explorer on all of the on all browsers, you know, for web browsers. And remember, it was in the United, in the, uh, not in the United States, it was in the European Union that a lot of that antitrust action started. And a lot of the punishment, you know, billions of dollars, a lot of lost customers. If you think about where Microsoft was and then where it basically the door it opened for Apple and Google and Linux to kind of enter, enter that market, and really reduce the kind of the dominance of Microsoft. It took the company 15 years to really turn things around, refocus on what it was good at and really focus on that business community what it what it would do really well and what it would do better than anyone else but microsoft isn't the same company isn't the same you know it's still a very strong company but not nearly in the same dominant position that it was in mm -hmm. you know, 1999 than it is 20 years later in 2019 you know it's like i said i you know people think well there's no way that anyone would uh, there yeah you know, google is everything and you know, Facebook, like, oh, billions of people and Amazon this and Apple this. But I think we forget how quickly those fortunes can change when this sort of activity and this sort of behavior starts to kind of, you know, get to that critical mass 
where mm-hmm. people start to demand action. Uh, not only they vote with their feet and they stop using it, uh, but they also go to their elected officials and push. And in a big enough market like the EU, if you have to change for the EU, I can tell you from you know clients I counsel in the United States have you know and GDPR for instance. I can tell you that the U.S. is following GDPR in most cases because it's so hard to know. You know who's coming from where, uh, and you know just being able to you know you know being able to do that. So it doesn't matter where in the world you start to lose customers based on what you're doing. The ripple effect is profound, and Microsoft is the biggest poster child of that. But mm-hmm. you start to see that with you know Facebook's user, you know kind of user base beginning to shrink, and the engagement in the platform beginning to shrink over time in certain mm-hmm. areas. It doesn't take long for that to cascade into really big, really big problems. Yeah. So um, on to the slide number three, we had a, um, a really good slide here. Do we really care? I mean, look at that poor little dog. Uh, do we, you know, do we really care about the way we're being marketed to? Isn't it kind of isn't it kind of fun to when people, you know, we buy a suitcase and then that, that Amazon says, Oh, well, what about this suitcase? And, uh, you know, I don't know. Tell me. Is it, it's kind of funny, you know, every time we think like, Oh, just, it's, it's amazing. What kind of data, uh, you know, what kind of data, Am- you know, what can Amazon do with its data? Well, I'll give you a really personal example that I think that most people can relate to. And all the examples of like, oh, I got the suitcase and oh, here's this awesome product that just goes along with the suitcase. And that's great. It seems, it seems exciting. Well, it's cherry picking because most of the time when I'm on Amazon, because I've had, you know, we bought, you know, stuff for Christmas and there are these things called Skylanders. You know, if familiar with what a Skylander is, it's this kind of video game kind of thing. And when my kids were little, uh, they were really into these things. And there were these little like figurines that you would put on this little pad. And then that figurine would appear in the video game and you could play with this thing. Okay. You're looking at me like I'm a little nuts, but trust me, these are real things. They are absolutely real things. And you know, we would search for these things. And we, so we bought all manner of different things on Amazon. I can tell you nearly 10 years later, they're still trying to sell us Skylanders. They're still like, they're still saying, oh, well, here are things that might interest you. It doesn't. Kids, if they understood kids as like a whole person, they'd understand that kids grow up and kids go through phases. And after about six months, they were not interested in these things at all. So when you think about like, oh, here's data and these correlation analyses we're doing. Here's the problem is the correlation fallacy. Correlation fallacy is the more you... If you have a big enough data set and you run it enough times and look for correlations, you will find correlations by random chance. It doesn't mean they mean anything. Mm-hmm. And just you know, kind of putting in just a little bit of a human touch on, huh, these people were looking for Skylanders that are products for kids. Their kids must have gotten older. They're probably not interested anymore. And I'll bet you can think of a dozen different examples of just kind of head scratching, bizarre recommendations you get from Amazon that have nothing to do. Like they still market horror movies to me. Well, one of my kids is into horror movies for a while as another phase. We still get this bizarre stuff that Amazon thinks we should buy. So when you think about, okay, do people really care? Well, every time one of those things is wrong, it reminds you that you're being sold to. And Every time you are reminded you're being sold to, you are a little bit harder to sell to. That's something we know as marketing people, that the more you remind your customer that they're in a sales process, the less they want to be in it because nobody likes to be sold to. So, you know, I think about that and I say, well, do people really care? Do people care about privacy? Uh, People are funny. People are complex, complex creatures. They don't care until instantly they do. And then they do, and then you're done. And if you've been kind of treating them funny this entire time, 
and all of a sudden they realize it. Uh, or you kind of get that network effect theory where, yeah, one person individually may not care, but all of a sudden now five of their friends are all kind of putting a little sticky note over their webcam. Well, now you're going to do it. You know, so you want to be really careful that you're not misinterpreting a little bit of apathy here and there at a specific moment in time for people don't care as a blanket statement, because over the longer arc of history, you know that's not true. People do care, uh, but you can't tell when they're going to care, and you, you you better not get that part wrong. Right. <clears throat> what are some specific numbers or percentages that you have, like, um, of our data that you have to say to to prove that people really do care? I mean, why should we care? Kind of thing. Well, here's the thing, you know, there's a, there's a slide I put together that has the, you know, that it, it's a study, uh, you know, based on it's a sustainable branding study. And it's essentially said that 65% of people uh, are more likely to purchase from a brand that aligns with their values and that aligns with kind of, you know, them as a, as a whole person than someone who's just trying to sell to them. And we think, well, is that just how people answer surveys? You know, is that really real? Do we actually see evidence of that? And the most recent example of, yeah, we're seeing evidence of that is in the United States, uh, the advertising that Nike did around Colin Kaepernick. And if people on the, on the podcast don't know who it is, Google it. Uh, I won't go through the whole story, but essentially... Colin Kaepernick took a stand. You can either agree with it or disagree with it. It doesn't matter. But Nike threw in their lot with that statement about racial justice in the United States. Again, you can either say that's a good idea or a bad idea. But I can tell you from the, the data on sales, sales didn't go down. You know, there was a lot of that kind of anger around that. But what people respected is that Nike took a stand that aligned with their values and people went out and bought the products, you know, because they wanted a product that aligned with their values. They wanted to, you know, to do business with a company that aligned with their values. There were a lot of people who said, well, that company doesn't align with my values and I'm not going to buy it. Well, great. The people who it, the incentive to align with values is more powerful than the incentive to not do that. So you know, what happened was the net effect was Nike saw sales go up of and their stock go up of, you know, uh, of those type of products. So essentially what the lesson that companies are learning is, listen, stand for something, uh, align your values with the values that people have. And that's not something that is reductive. It's not something that you can pin a piece of data on. People, right. even if people didn't exactly agree with that particular stand and that particular issue, people saw that, okay, you stand for something. I want to be, I'll, I want to have the Nike swoosh on my chest because they stand for something. And you know, they're taking a stand on that. And that's what I want to associate with, even if I don't agree with everything, you know, they, they want that association. So you know, and, and you see that all over the place. In the photo, it was the uh, boxed water is better, you know, for the dog. But you know, people are buying, you know, people are buying things that are more expensive, you know, because the boxed water is more expensive than buying a cheap plastic water bottle because like, they just want to be associated with that. So there's a lot of psychology around why people would want to do that. And we, we kind of, forget about that when we just kind of reduce things to how do we sell you another blue waterproof shirt? You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, how do we kind of think a little bigger and think a little different? And it's something that honestly, uh, you know, something that uh, my dad and his ad agency would have thought through in the seventies because right. that's, you know, you wanted to stand for something at that time because you didn't have all this data. You didn't have, you couldn't do all of that other stuff. You had to make those kind of choices. I'm not saying that you throw the baby out with the bathwater and you don't use the data you have. That's ridiculous. But yeah. there's a better way to use the data that you have. That's the so, key. That's the key. 
Right. So Jason, let's, let's get into how, how do we do this? Let's talk about how we can better reach out to our customers with ethical marketing um, through humanization, as you put it. Yes, I think when you when you think about humanization, it really humanization operationalizes into three distinct concepts: transparency, agency, and respect. Okay? So it's not about collecting or not collecting the data. It's not about using or not using your data. It's about how you use it. So you know the you know the more it's, it's so much more about why you're using that data. You know, data and data collection are a part of modern life. You know. But a lot of companies are operating under the collect everything and figure out why later. And you know, being more purposeful about what you're doing and thinking about, okay, well, how do we, you know, how do we think about things, you know, in a transparent way, giving people agency. And what that means is giving people power, you know, over what they're doing. Okay. And respect, respecting people as a full person. So those are the three things. And uh, we put together some examples of how we may do that, because what, what I found is that even within the same company, uh, you know, I put together examples of how you look at kind of transparency, agency, and respect, even in the same company, being able to do things in a transparent, not transparent way in, you know, kind of in the same, you know, it, it's, not to say that like, hey, Facebook bad, Apple good. That's silly. You know, it's a matter of we need to think a little bit more broadly about that. But it's so much easier once you start to see, oh, here's some examples of how this is done. I think you'll be able to start to see, you know, okay, well, what, you know, the challenge that I have for everybody is how would you knowing, you know, seeing these examples and what we're going to talk through, think about, well, what am I doing that would be, that is not transparent? What am I doing that is giving people agency? What am I doing that isn't showing respect? And I'm hoping that my hope is that these examples really challenge you to think mm -hmm. about what you're doing. So, so, let's, so yeah. let's look at some of those examples then. Um, if we could pull those up the next, uh, there's one, transparent, not transparent. Talk, talk us through this thing. Yeah, let's let's hold this slide here, Tony. And Tony, Tony is in the background making all this stuff work. So we appreciate you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, Tony yeah, really thanks. exists. I'm a fan of the Dan Carlin podcast, by the way. It's a history podcast. There's a guy named Ben. Anyone who knows this now knows that Ben is never on, you know, never on camera, but Ben exists. So Tony exists. He's a real person. I've talked with him. Uh, <laughs> so hold, hold the slide here for a second. Uh, this is Audible. I'm a big fan of Audible uh, audiobooks. Uh, they're owned by Amazon, of course. So uh, you know, so you get a full transparency there. I don't own any stock or any interest in Audible at all. I'm just a big fan. Okay. So let's look at transparency and not transparency. And this is all about data. Okay. Uh, so how are you using the data? I create on Audible a wish list, and if you've been on Audible, you know what I'm talking about. You go, you create a wish list. You can buy your audiobooks, or you can create books for like, okay, I might want to do that. I might want to buy that one later. So I'm going to put it in a wish list. Now what Audible will do, and they'll send me emails on occasion that say, Hey, Jason, I see that you're interested in this book and it's on sale. You might want to go buy that book. If you're thinking about that book, we put it on sale. Here you go. The transparency there is I can go in and I can turn on and off that setting but it's using that data that they have about me with a specific product that I've expressed interest in. And they're telling me, Hey, you know, that book you're interested in is on sale. It's not some book that we, some algorithm decided was going to be something you'd be interested in. It's a book that, you know, you've explicitly said that you're interested in. So Again, that's that kind of transparency for, okay, well, what's the, what are we trying to, you know, what are we, what are we trying to do? Contrast that to uh, the credit system. And here's part of my issue, uh, part of my issue with Audible, and I had to figure it out because I made the mistake a couple of times before I figured it out. A credit on Audible costs anywhere, depending on how you buy it, between $12 and $17. 
Okay? So a credit can be used to buy basically any audiobook in their library. Okay? So you can think about it for a second, like, okay, well, I buy a credit, and I would expect when I go into Audible that all the credits are, or all the books are just like, hey, every book is just one credit. Just pick, pick whatever you want. That's not how it works at all. Okay? How it works is every book has a price. And they don't tell you, like they don't remind you next to the price that says, hey, here's an audiobook for $7.99. You can say, hey, do you want to pay $7.99 or do you want to use one credit? It seems like transparency, but it kind of isn't. Okay. Because there's no reminder, hey, wait a second, all they'd have to do is in, in parentheses behind one credit, here's how much you paid for your credit. Because if you looked at that, you'd say, well, do I want to use one credit that I paid $12 for? Or do I want to just buy the book for $7.99? So in other words, if I use my one credit on that book, I'm overpaying by you know, $4 or $5 or whatever the case may be. Now, Audible counters with, well, some books are $30 or $40 or $50, and you can go and you can go ahead and buy that book for one credit. Isn't that fine? I got it. No problem with that. I totally get that, hey, audiobooks cost different amounts that you got and that the credit is kind of a fixed thing. Totally get it. Simply be transparent about, you know, what your you know, what you're paying for. And yeah, tell me when I'm getting the good deal. Great. I'm super excited about that. But also tell me like, hey, you could use a credit for this, but just know that, you know, you're kind of overpaying for that. And you might want to just pay for this one separately. Uh, it's, it, and again, that's just a human way to look at it. It's the kind of thing, my, my dad was a big fan of the silver rule. Don't do unto others what you would not like to have done unto you. And my point is, boy, I don't like it when that happens to me. And I probably wouldn't like it to have it happen to someone else. And the fix is so easy. It's such a little thing. It just seems like, well, yeah, it's just audiobooks. Well, what if it were prescription drugs? What if it were something like your insulin? And in the EU, you guys probably don't think about that as much. In the United States, people die uh, when that doesn't happen. So right. yeah, audiobooks in one case, like no one needs an audiobook. People need insulin. And the pricing is just as not transparent as what I've shown here. Actually, it's a lot less transparent than this. So, yeah. you know, when you think about like, well, okay, you're kind of picking on Audible. You're smart enough to figure out, the, you know, the price difference in books. And if you spent a little bit too much, you know, screw you. I don't really care. But, uh, the consequences of lack of transparency can be much, much deeper than that. And I think we need to, we need to just be conscious of that. So that's the, I would challenge you, anyone looking at this to think, could we be more transparent? How could we be more transparent? And because I had to figure it out in Audible and I'll tell you, I don't trust them. Uh, like yeah. I, used to. I look at everything that that they send me now to figure out well, where's the trick, where are they mm -hmm. trying to fool me, and you know I'm going to make sure uh, that I'm not being tricked anymore. Well, anytime people do that, boy, there's another there's another option out there. I'm out. Right. So, I was just going to ask you, have you looked for other options since that happened to you? Yeah, I actually have a couple other options that I'm trying out from different independent publishers. They don't have the same kind of selection, but uh, if I can get most of what I want or if I can get some of my other books there, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, and uh, that just means I buy less at Audible. Uh, it doesn't so that's mean that's a great example. A great example of how this kind of marketing you can, can hurt your bottom line. Boom. Absolutely. It's... Uh, it's just, it's little things where, boy, it, it, what the biggest thing it makes people do when you're not transparent, you're not honest with people, it makes people, when they figure you out, they know you kind of deceived them. It's not a lie. It's, it's kind of like a little white liar. It's a little bit where it's kind of like a lie by omission. I didn't happen to tell you what the credit cost right next to where it would be useful for you. You could have easily figured it out by clicking another couple pages. 
But what happens is it makes you feel like, I, it kind of irritated me a little bit. If another option comes along, I am more receptive uh, to that pitch. Whereas mm -hmm. before, uh, I wouldn't even look at anyone else. Right. You know, it's like, hey, I've, I've got it. I like it. Well, now I'm, now I'm okay taking a look at someone else. I, I, let's see if there's, a, if there's another option out there. Right. And maybe even just to spite them. There are a few book publishers I've gone to with, you know, and I've bought the book there and I've even paid a little bit more just to spite them. Uh, and people will do stuff like that. People will do irrational stuff because yeah. they, they feel like, boy, if you're going to trick me, I'm going to go after you. Um, you know, it's that same thing where people think about um, like the, it, when people figure out, for instance, when you do a Google search, a lot of times I do a Google search for a company. At the top, there's an ad and underneath is their organic search result. As soon as you start to figure out this company's kind of pissed me off, I'm going to click on the one, the ad one on purpose because I know that costs them like three or four bucks. And I'll <laughs> click on the ad every time. You know, the so people do like kind of like little punishments like that. I, mm -hmm. You know what? You don't need to do that. Just be transparent with people. It, it works. It totally works. It'll say, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy that with the credit or, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to buy it because I don't want to get another charge on my credit card this month. I already got that one. No problem. Right. A couple extra dollars. At least I know I'm doing it. That That's the point. Just be upfront with people and like what a human would do human so being what's what's your sorry go ahead sorry yeah yeah no that's it they just be upfront with you yeah well let's talk about your next example because i think you know for me this is a big uh a big one. Oh, this uh, is uh, yeah this is agency and you know let's let's kind of hold this example up here uh, for, you know, for a minute. And ag what agency means is I'm going to empower people. I'm going to give people the power to achieve their goals. And, you know, it, it kind of a key component of humanization is, okay, how do I help people achieve something bigger than themselves? So, you know, when, when I think about that, one of the best examples I can think of right now is uh, kind of big, you know, not to pick on Amazon again, uh, but uh, they do an excellent job and created a new opportunity in the market with Kindle Direct Publishing. If you're an author and you have any experience going through the traditional publishing process, you know how frustrating it can be. There, it's a very tight, controlled market where you know if you're not a big name or you you don't get really, really lucky, the chances of you being able to publish your book, you know, are is essentially zero. You know, they're, they're just no good way to do that. But what Amazon did with their platform is they said, wait, we're going to give people tools to help them, you know, get their manuscript formatted, do copy editing, you know, get it printed, get it on the Amazon store, get, you know, all of these things that really for hundreds of thousands of people have given them the opportunity to see their work in print. Most books, to be really honest, sell 20 to 50 copies, mostly to family and friends, you know, but think about it. There are a lot of people I know who have used it to tell stories about their family, to tell stories that wouldn't be told otherwise that only maybe a couple hundred people would ever care about. But think about how humanizing that really is to provide people a platform to be able to do that. Uh, it's a, one of the, probably uh, of all the things Amazon has done to kind of yeah, in the marketplace that's positive, fostering this level of creativity is one of the uncompromisingly positive things uh, that we've seen. But, and there's always a but, uh, that on the other side is, okay, you've got this platform and yeah, there's that kind of altruistic side, but the other side of it is how do people use that to, you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of people out there hundreds of thousands of books. And this story of copy paste Chris is a, is an instructive one or essentially in the romance genre, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of books published every month. So much content out there. Uh, what this particular person did, and she's not alone, nor is this unique to the romance industry where 
uh, essentially what she is alleged to have done and the lawsuits are pending uh, is that you know the, the allegation is she used uh, subcontractors at Fiverr uh, to go and you, they would grab portions of books, kind of create this Frankenstein book and then sell it under a new cover. And again, all allegations, but I can tell you that based on other, you know, Amazon has a pretty significant counterfeiting problem. And what's happening is, uh, you know, it's, you know, according to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States, you know, platforms are immune from prosecution for what people on their platform do. Mm-hmm. So Amazon is, Alice, uh, uh, I had a former boss who called it alligator arms, you know, like, just kind of like, no, 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 I, I'm not going to touch that. You know, this is, uh, you know, this is something we don't need to worry about because it's bad actors on our platform who, who are doing that. When we see it, we'll take action. Here's why that's BS. Okay. Uh, uh, Amazon has plenty of data inside their books on, you know, they can tell you where in the book people stopped. They have all of the content digitized. It's all, it's not like optical character recognition. They have all the text in there. They could do that. There is technology out there today that every college professor uses to do copyright, you know, and plagiarism checks. It's very easy with the technology they have to be able to flag that kind of material and stop it from ever being published. Here's the thing. What it does for the content creators is it's a huge disincentive to put their content on Amazon. I know a lot of authors and publishers who are independent who have said, I'm gonna go to Amazon's publishing alternatives because I can't trust that my content's not going to get lifted and plagiarized really easily and get repackaged and resold in another language. I can tell you myself from things I've published on other platforms that they get pilfered from that platform and plugged into new ones And you can see a lot of my writing, for instance, on all manner of different websites, uh, you know, mostly in, even in the EU, uh, where there was, you know, there's, you know, no copyright, no permission, just completely plagiarized. It's really hard to go and police that sort of thing, but the platform certainly can do that. You know, they have the technology to do it. But again, that kind of robs the content creator of their agency. You know, kind of like, yep, I gave it to you, but I kind of created this kind of wild west for you to be able to protect yourself. And like, you know, kind of with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, You know, to quote Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, you know, the bigger your platform is, the more responsibility you have, you know, with the kind of, you know, with the kind of, uh, uh, you know, you know, not only with the volume you have, but with the kind of money you have there to be able to invest in that technology, you know, there is a responsibility there that grows with scale that, you know, it's you know, like, no, uh, it's not fair that Amazon would have to do it, yet a very much smaller publisher wouldn't, or wouldn't have the same responsibility. Hey, when we give you a lot of power, I think a lot of organizations struggle with, hey, the bigger you get, the your responsibility, you know, the responsibility is broader than just your shareholders it beca- and customers. It becomes more of a stakeholder responsibility uh, because we are allowing you to operate that way in the marketplace. Right. You know, we're breaking you up as a monopoly like we, we might want to consider. So in the last, um, in the last 10 minutes, I know you have another example um, if you want to go through that um, quickly, because it's another good, good one. I'll go very quickly. This is, I didn't want to pick on the, I didn't want to pick on the, the big platforms, uh, you know, solely, uh, because you can look at this at the retail level too. And this is Walgreens, for instance. And Walgreens sending very specific, you know, prescription reminders out, you know, based on data that you have, you know, you've privately shared, you know, it's kind of that level of respect, kind of treating people like you'd want to be treated. Like, hey, I've got this data. I'm going to help you out by, you know, hey, I've got your back. You know, the, you, this prescription should be refilled at this particular time. 
uh, and you should probably come in, especially with medical information and prescriptions. Timing is a really big deal. So sending really private targeted messages is a real deep show of respect that like, hey, we're going to take care of this information. We're going to take care of you. But at the same time, when you walk into that Walgreens and you walk by their coolers, their coolers fucking watching you. Okay? Mm-hmm. So and basically what they're doing is they're looking for where, where is your gaze lingering on the screen so that they can figure out where on the shelf, you know, the Coca-Cola should be versus the Pepsi should be versus the, you know, uh, versus the kombucha tea should be and all those sort of things. They're trying to kind of optimize their retail footprint. Got it. Here's the problem. How much do I trust that you're going to have a firewall between the prescription information that you just got and the facial recognition re- recognition information that you've just got and not put two and two together and that information gets hacked or it gets leaked and now all of a sudden people have not only my private health information, but they've also got my face, my time, where I was, what I was buying at that time. Mm-hmm. That's that sort of thing where... Okay, I in the same company, such deep respect for using their data in a respectful way and treating people how they'd want to be treated. And at the same time, you know, doing something that is you know, blatantly disrespectful on, you know, like, boy, do I really need to know, like, how much of that information do I really need to know to sell a couple more, you know, a couple more 20 ounce bottles of Coca Cola? You know, we understood kind of shelf positioning technology, you know, 30 years ago. This isn't that, this isn't that hard to know kind of eye level stuff is the most important and it tends to, you know, when you go up and you go down, it tends to, tends to go down pretty quickly. Can you optimize a few more sales of Coca-Cola, you know, for the risk that, you know, that the risk that you know, this data could be in the wrong place at the wrong time is just something to think about in, you know, in terms of, yep, they say, hey, your information is kept separate and it's not, you know, it, you know hey, this information isn't used with this information. I gotcha. Uh, that, that's good until later we discover and we've discovered again and again and again that it's not that well done and it's not that well protected. And once it's out, you can't put the horse back in the barn. You know, once the data is out, it's out, you know, so, you know, you know, and what will people do? Well, they'll probably start to wear sunglasses. They'll start to cover their face. And and people do that sort of thing when they know they're being watched by those things. So uh, a good example, or I'll go through the drive-thru and I won't walk into Walgreens anymore. Uh, Well, they, you know, if I don't walk in, I'm not buying anything. So... You know, so how might we want to do that in a more respectful way and just thinking about like, you know, what could we do differently? Uh, You know, what, what's the most important information that we want to share with people and show respect for people and then know, Hey, I, I, I'm going into the store because they sent me really good information about when I need to be there. I feel good about them. I'll buy stuff while I'm there. Right. You know, people will usually do that. I think next time, um, because now we're running out of time again, um, but I think we should talk more about the tools that that people can use that that are not, you know, to, for marketing, you know, that, that don't track you. Like, I'm sorry to say Google, but, you know, Google AdWords, you know, all these things that, that track people, that follow them around, just like they do in the store at Walgreens. Um, that it's you know, creepy is sort of the, the word, right? Um, next time, let's talk about some of those tools. And, yeah, um, we, I think it's important that we do because these platforms have gotten into a lot of trouble with things like programmatic advertising where, okay, I'm going to find places to kind of put these ads on whatever website you visit. Well, you can get an ad next to some really bad content and YouTube has had a really hard time with this. And YouTube has struggled with advertisers pulling out and saying, I don't want my ad next to some video that's hate speech, you know? So you, you get into these, 
use issues where if you look at that kind of reductive technology, where you're just looking at a very narrow kind of if this, then that sort of a really narrow kind of piece of technology, and you're not looking at the situation holistically, it is really easy to run into these situations where, you know, you get kind of nasty unintended consequences. Right. Um, so that about wraps it up for today, but we want to let people uh, find Jason. So there's a, there's a last little visual that we have here. There you go. Um, Jason, how can people find you? A, a lot of different places. I, on the top left corner, that's my LinkedIn profile so that you can, you know, you can see that I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. There are not many Jason Voyevich's. Uh, if you find another one, please let me know because he's, <laughs> uh, uh, you can go to my blog at jasontvoyevich.com for writing and kind of, uh, you know, reading. And then the bottom two are a couple of, uh, commercial ventures I'm involved in, in the, in full transparency. I'm a frac chief marketing officer. That's the bottom right. And then I have a, uh, a business where I help other marketing professionals go into business for themselves through a comprehensive training program. That's UFM and that's down in the lower left. So again, full transparency. If you go find me, you'll see lots of different things. And I'm just really, I'm passionate about, you know, uh, the field of marketing that, that I'm in kind of it's past, present and future. And, you know, uh, so if you look at what I am and what I do, uh, that's, everything kind of lines up into one of those three buckets. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, if also you can find us on IDCA, don't forget idka.com, www.idka.com, right on your screen, sign up for a free account and uh, bring your private groups and organizations to connect, store and share anything while your privacy remains intact. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Jason, it's a pleasure. I guess we're doing show number three at some point. We'll talk about that offline. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to everyone who's uh, who's watching and challenge yourself a little bit. I think you'll be glad you did. All right. Have a nice afternoon, evening, morning, everybody. And join us again next time.